Well, hello. Welcome to the Ball Over Passion Roundtable podcast. Um, Ball Over Passion podcast, it's our opportunity to sit down with fans, talk about football and football only. Um, today, we actually have a very interesting topic. I think it's going to be a heated one, to be fair. But before we start, let me introduce myself. I'm your host, Z. Um, alongside me, I have my panel, um, Corin. Hi, guys. Really looking forward to today's topic. Um, yeah. Chris, yo man, it's CK on Twitter, but yeah, and we've got ourselves the most knowledgeable George. How are you doing today? Very humbled, mate. Awesome. I'm looking forward to this one. Okay, so we actually have a the most heated topic I think that goes trending on Twitter. I think almost every day. Um, it's the Arteta ultimate debate. Um. First of all, before we start, any questions? Are you Arteta in or out, George? I am Arteta in. We'll keep what it nice, short and simple. <laughs> what about you, Curran? <laughs> oh, of course I'm Arteta. No, I'm Arteta in. Of course, come on, man. Sure. Anyone with ball, they know. They know the score. They know what's going on. It's Arteta in all day. Surely we need someone to balance the argument. Chris, what about you? I'm, I'm Arteta in. I'm Arteta in. <sighs> <laughs> All right, okay. What about you, Z? What about you? Um, to be fair, I think I'm just right in the middle, to be fair. I, I'm I'm waiting to see how he does in in the summer with the players that he's going to bring in. And then I'll give him until December to see, you know, how our team evolves and progresses. Otherwise, just gonna add something quickly. Yeah, is, sure. Uh, um we are really I really wanted to, I really want to emphasize that it's you have it's you if you're Arteta in until December, I think that's the that, I think that's you cannot you can't look at things beyond a certain period. You have to look at how things go. So Arteta in until December is definitely my position as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean great. <laughs> All right, let's start with the questions. Um I'm gonna start with you, Chris. Um let's give you the opportunity to speak since mm. I think you're probably the most excited about Arteta. Um so you've seen in the um last summer, um Miko Arteta, um he was actually appointed as head coach and then he um I think something happened and he became the manager of Arsenal Football Club alongside um Eddie, who was his assistant. Um do you think something has changed within the club? Are there any different expectations from him at all? Um, I think definitely from a fan perspective, there's more expectation. Regardless of that position, there was more expectation because he had a chance to go into his first season. Um, I think the title change means that he has more responsibility, more is he has more earnest to change the squad, in, um, get his own players in eventually. Um, with a head coach, I think they really focus on just improving players and only the results. And I think with a manager, it's more the squad, other people in the actual team in Arsenal. And yeah, I think we've changed with the change, he's got more responsibility. So therefore with more responsibility comes more blame. Yeah, I mean I I think of that too. What I'm what I really want to find out is what are the differences? So he's obviously going to coach the team and um, you know set up all the tactics. But are there any going to be any significant differences that you know that could have been in place with regard um, without even calling him the manager? What do you think, Curran? I think the other thing. I mean, when you talk about responsibilities, the main thing between a first team coach and a manager is the is the trust placed in the manager. It's a it's a ability to really dictate transfer policy. It's an ability to dictate how the squad. We're talking about call ups from youth and put downs from youth. There's more responsibility involved. It's more of a a, a play. Uh, you're in, put in a place of, of responsibility to shepherd the future of the club. You're put in more of an, of, of an opportunity to say that look the man the, the ownership have really put in put in place as a the trust in you. That they will say, look, you our are our you are our guy. This is the way we we want you to dictate how the culture of this club will evolve. And I think that's the main difference between how we can see these two positions. And um, George, do you think um, this manager title could affect Arteta in the long run? And um, do you think 
it, it's come too soon for him. Um, not for him. And I, I've always felt that he's had the charisma and he's had the uh, gravitas to demand that title, to be honest with you, from the very start. It was something that was very clear that he wanted ownership of, very much in the mold of a Wenger or a Pep or an authoritarian coach. He wanted the control uh, for this. So in terms of it coming too soon, to be honest with you, I think we as fans uh, lean into recency bias in terms of the outcome to determine whether that was a good or bad decision. I think when you have a manager like him, and I call him a manager like him, you have to give him the tools to succeed. If you restrict him and he does poorly, I think then you end up hampering the man. And so ultimately, I, I think it did not come too soon. And I think he had been doing things behind the scenes that demanded himself to be put in that limelight, regardless of a title change. I'm just trying to play devil's advocate here. Um, I personally think it might have just come a bit too early for him, not only because maybe it's his first job, but I I personally think we should have just let him um, stick with the whole coaching side until, you know, we, we were a bit more familiar. Because now what's happened is we're seeing the unrest within the fan base. We're seeing the unrest, you know, within the club as well. And I think maybe if... if in, in a different world, um, if Arteta wasn't the manager and just head coach, I think we would have probably seen a, 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 a more united fan base and probably different performances. I don't know. I, I'm just playing devil's advocate. Uh, do you guys agree or disagree? Do you, do you think that the fan base is nuanced enough to distinguish between first coach, team coach and manager? I think the performance on the pitch would be the performance on the pitch and that's how they would judge the manager. So going, going back to the whole um, point of him be becoming head coach versus the manager, do you think ultimately he will have to maybe lose some of the long-term ambitions in order to make sure um, short-term Arsenal are thriving? Or do you think there has to be a balance? What do you think, Chris? Um, there always has to be a balance, to be honest. Because I think that Arteta is the type of, with Arteta's style, I think it will benefit us more so long term than short term. But the ben the benefits in the long term will be so much so that I think it's worth maybe suffering in the short term, which I don't think we have. But the overall view is that we've suffered and failed in the short term. Um, I think that in the short term so far, he's done a, a decent job. And in the short term coming, I think we will actually see a proper improvement, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, George, so going back to what Chris has said, we've finished eighth this uh, season. We went out in the semi-finals of the Europa League. We we haven't won any cups. For me, I, I look at this season as a failure, just from, just from a broad perspective, because we haven't done anything significant to show improvement across all boards but when we're looking long term maybe there was a you know a, a movement forward there's a progress but how responsible do you think Arteta is for the short term in expense for the long-term vision at Arsenal Football Club well I, I don't think there is really um, any expense in terms of the short term I always look at long-term philosophies because they're the most reproducible and they're also the most sustainable there's no uh, we, we have kind of an example of short-termism with Manchester United. Um, we have a case of a club who, in the same time of losing one of their patriarchs, haven't really returned back to the top, having changed three or four managers, having gone through three or four cycles of players, while ultimately not achieving much more than us in terms of trophy output, if we're being completely honest. Perhaps standings are completely different, but at the end of the day, the output in terms of trophies since Alex Ferguson has left and even in terms of that time period to us, we've actually had very similar outputs in terms of trophies. So when you look at what is the best way forward, I've always felt that you build long-term foundations in order to sustain that at the top level. Because what I don't want is a short-term success to brush over the idea that we can't reproduce that for years to come. And so at that expense, I don't believe a short-term output is gonna be beneficial for the club. We've needed a long overdue haul um, from ground up for many years. Um, and the fact that we're doing that right now is only going to help us establish where we want to be for longer. I don't want to be a flash in the pan. I want to be a giant again. And that's 
really the major difference here. Um, in terms of maybe the short-term output, I'm sure we'll get into it a little later. I think it's been a little bit conflated um, in terms of how well he's actually done this season. And I think we'll get into the nitty gritty a little bit later, but in terms of the overall question, absolutely. You need to build foundations for the long term if you want to be considered as one of the greats again, not just a flash in the pan. Current, anything you want to add to that? I mean, as I said before, if you're talking about uh, long, short-term success, I mean, if you look at the season as a whole, I feel it can be split into two halves of the season. I mean, if you look at, I mean, we'll get into later, but if you look at the squad that we had at the time, there was one position that was clearly lacking, and that was a number 10. And with all the overhaul at the club, we played, what, the first half of the season without a pure number 10 or a number or an attacking, not even a number 10, an attacking midfielder that could really provide and pre present opportunities to our attacking players. So in terms of short-term success, I feel like it's been over overinflated this ability, this this meme culture around Arteta that he's some sort of cone merchant that has been uh, he just works on the training page, he doesn't know tactically what he's doing. I feel if if we're conflating the memes with actual football knowledge and football uh, the actual footballing output of the team, I feel like we get lost in in fan culture rather than actually talking about football itself and. The, the results show from from when Emil Smith Rowe is has turned up in the in the in the, in the first team, the, the the fortune of the club have really upturned and we've really succeeded. And that also comes from when you say, see, for example, you sell an Aaron Ramsey and a Henrik Mkhitaryan in the same window. Mm. You really when you decimate your squad like that and you really pull it towards. Uh, a different type of philosophy. It takes a, a whole lot to bring it back to where it was. So that's my opinion, anyway. Okay. <laughs> Again, I, I'm going. I'm going to play devil's advocate. Do you not think Arteta probably just uh, got lucky with the whole ESR situation? Um, he wasn't playing. Luck, or, luck or not, luck or not. Luck. If, if even if it was luck, it doesn't matter. The fact is, what is the output? What is the output of the player, and how mm. has it changed the fortunes of the team? That's the point. I don't. Point I don't is. think it was luck because even before the um, the season in the summer, you can see many quotes about Arteta talking about Smith Rowe and saying how he loves him as a player from Huddersfield, and he's going to bring him into the team next season. So, him coming in after being injured, people can call it luck. I don't call it luck. I just saying he was injured and then he came into the team later. Ultimately, I don't feel like it matters. The ma what matters is output. Narratives are narratives. We can all go off on on the these mm. narrative based based arguments, but the point is the fact of the matter is is that we've averaged over two points a game with him in the team. And I think this is really worth that, this is really worth saying ultimately when you're talking about broad strokes. So we're going to get into the nitty gritty, but I've always sure. said. In football, in order to sustain attacking patterns, which is the biggest critique levied at Arteta, can he coach attacking patterns? Well, you need two things in order to sustain attacking patterns. That's transitional control, and you also need a presence between the lines with technical security. Now, if you look factually at the beginning portions of our season, and when you do bookend Christmas Day or Boxing Day, the fact of the matter is Partey, while we had him, he was injured. He was not playing. And so this idea that he had him as an option is ludicrous for people to evaluate. So we no longer had any technical security between the lines and we didn't have any control of transitions in the team. And so you have major holes in trying to sustain a formation, whether that's three at the back, four at the back, it doesn't matter. If you don't have those two core principles in your team, you are not going to succeed. So when you do bookend the season like that, it's worth mentioning it's the only time in the season that Arteta, forget quality, has had the same profiles as his peers. And so then when you begin to compare, okay, I'm looking at a team, forget the quality, but they have this profiles there, you should be able to produce output. And I think we've seen that very, very clearly. I'm sure we'll get into the differences of the season, but the reason that becomes such a large argument is because it's the only time in the season that the profiles of the team were at least matched to his competitors, and he had the options. It wasn't like before he had them and he chose not to play them. He simply did not have those options available and fit. 
just just to add on to that is the fact is is that Emil Smith Rowe is a technical leader in in and he provides an option in either half space. His ability to his ability is to escape tackles, his ability to link up play, and his ability to run at defenders is something we had missed in that first half of the season. And you see, and again, I will re-emphasize this: the uh, the technical ability has led to an ability to out to increase our attacking output to an exponential degree. And without that, you cannot win games. So. If you're if you're looking at in terms of where our season has gone and we're talking about failures and successes, I feel like if you look at the short term, sure it's been a failure. But if you're looking at the long term, there is the the foundations for a long term project that are that can provide not just minor honors but major honors that will take us back to historic heights. So that is my mm-hmm. overall opinion on this. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, assuming. Well, all, all of the conditions are in place. We've got all the players we want. We've got all the number tens we want. Let's say everything that we we lacked in the first half of the season, we now have in place. What? So, what are what are your expectations on Arteta now? Where do you see him um, finishing with the Arsenal, and how do you see us developing? It's well, very not simply, I'll t- I'll take this right off the bat. My expectations raise immediately. Um, with the profiles, it's a minimum of top four, and I would like a trophy, but I don't believe that we have the money or the financial backing to address squad depth in addition to a full starting 11. So I believe after this summer, summer 2021 is fixing the starting 11. With that, it becomes the top four minimum expectation. If you don't meet that, you have to go. Simple. The following summer, you address squad depth, and that becomes a title challenge. That's the expectations that I would like. I just want to, while we're here, because I I want to back up the short-term evidence that actually shows that we are top four cat challengers when we do have those profiles, is and that is looking since Boxing Day. So if you look at Arsenal in the Premier League since Boxing Day, that we have had 24 games. That accounts for over 60% of the season, and we have accumulated 47 points, which is second behind only Manchester City. We have scored 43 goals, which is tied for third for everybody in the league. We have conceded 21 goals, which again is second behind only City. Now, our record is 14 wins, five draws, five losses since Christmas. We have had 22 uh, plus 22 goal difference. We have been the clear objective best side in the league bar Manchester City over that period. Now, Arteta is young. He has his faults. He makes mistakes. And he definitely needs to improve in certain areas. But form over that period is no fluke. If sacked, and Mikel was sacked when we had a rough time, and somebody else produced this record, it would be lauded from everybody, including most of those that want Arteta out. A table from Boxing Day to the end of the season is a very lengthy amount of time to draw analysis from. It's not just a couple of months. So when Boxing Day was the first time that the manager was able to play his ideal system with a missing key piece back, it makes for sound evidence. Does it make the overall season a good one? No. It was a terrible first half. But if the improvement in terms of the league standing was only marginal, then okay, don't look at it. But to be second behind a super team in that period is simply an indication of progress on the field. Simple. Correct. What about you, Karen? What do you think? I mean, just just to back up the the, the points that have been made is the this idea that we have. Um, we have to address the first level. I think, I mean, George, don't kill me. I'm going to borrow one of your phrases here, but it's more of a case of, I feel this window is to, is to, is to build, is to raise the floor of the squad. I would rather have a, I don't feel, I feel like we are lacking a backup in a lot of areas. We'll get into it in a different podcast, I'm sure, but left back is an example uh, in central midfield, et cetera, et cetera. But I think if you if you have if you raise the if you raise the floor of the squad, I really do believe in the ceiling of this squad. There's a couple of real real gems in this squad, and I feel like that would would would, would be able to reach a top four level. Uh, if we're talking about the short term versus long term success, um, next season definitely has to be a top four season. By December, as I said at the beginning, there has to be an evaluation of how the squad is doing and 
how the the signings that um, Mikhail has made, how how they are producing, and how he is doing with how he is doing as a manager, and how, for example, things like his in-game management and how his squad management and man management, all these things we're going to discuss, how he's performing in all these areas. So. Um, Wait and see, but the signs are there, and the uh, the profiles of the squad are starting to take form. Um, yeah, Chris, what, do you have any expectations for Arteta? I mean, what's going to push your limits? What's going to make you feel like you know what? I love Arteta, or Arteta has to go. Um, for him to go, he has to. If he doesn't get top four, he has to go. Um, I think he will. I think he'll get third personally but if we don't get top four he has to change it regardless of how much I, I think he's a very good coach if he's not me um, results overtake that eventually so if he doesn't get top four then he has to leave but I think recently or since the since January I think he developed this he's used and developed a system which has done what we struggled to do much in the past couple of seasons, which is break down low blocks and beat top teams. We've, we've beat, we've had our best top six record in a long time. And we've, we've, we've beat many low blocks with ease since January. Yep. So with better players, with more technical security, with more pace and power, it's only going to improve. That's why I see next season they are doing very well. The other thing is, I would just like to add on is, the defensive structure of the team has improved. I don't know when the last time I've seen such a just defensively sound Arsenal team has been. And with the profiles of the squad that we have to, to achieve the defensive organisation and security that Arteta has achieved in the second half of the season, even the first half of the season, we're yeah. one of the best defences in the, the league. whole season, 39 goals conceded in 38 games. Conceded. I mean, that's just, that's just over a goal a game, which is unheard that's of for third best. Third best. There's, 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 no, there's, not, been, there's not been a... Uh, like, a, like we used, we're used to, as Arsenal fans, getting a, a 6-0 or a 5-1 or a a mental game or a 6-3 or something like this where we could just get battered. There hasn't been that this season. Sure, it's not been the best, the best, but there are signs that something is happening at this club. And I really want to emphasise that. Yeah. Um, Chris, I, I actually wanted to emphasise on what you mentioned um, previously on how many goals we've conceded. Do you think um, that's something that's completely unheard of for Arsenal? I mean, back I think about a season before we considered around more than forty goals, um, and to me that that shows that we had a terrible, terrible defense. Do you think Arteta has actually done anything to change the whole defensive structure of the club? Do you think he's done anything to change the whole culture of the club? Maybe we sit back a lot more and we attack teams a lot less, but you know, just to protect the, our back line. What do you think, Chris? We're much more regimented. Um, defensively nowadays, so even since he first came from the start, people people were thinking Mustafi's a good defender nowadays. Um, <laughs> our defensive structure is much better, which yeah. has made people realize um, the deficiencies in Leno. In my, um, with with our defense improving, it means the goalkeeper concedes less shots, meaning his shot stopping is less of a factor. So. With Arteta coming in, um, our build-up play from defence is more important, yeah. and we've conceded many more, sh many less shots, many less goals nowadays, and we and we haven't made that many defensive acquisitions apart from Gabriel and Cedric. Um, and we, yeah, and Mario, right Mario as well. Yeah. So, I was also thinking outside, probably outside the whole on the pitch. Do you think Otis has actually done anything anything else to influence the um, culture of the club? Ha has there been any significant changes? Um, what do you think, guys? Absolutely. He has had a certain amount of accountability. And the main thing is central compactness. When we talk about this defensive structure, about what he has changed, he has changed the structure in terms of how we attack off the ball. The surgery that he's done in our movement off the ball has been absolutely clear. And it's not a coincidence that we no longer see basketball games, I used to call it, like we did under Emery. And why? 
um, the, the structures is really so good. I just wanted to quell some kind of myths, and I think there's a little bit of short tis, short-termism about Arteta and what happened with the team. So when he first came in, he was very evident on employing a counter press very quickly, but our team was too tired to counter press. And so after 30 minutes, we used to get tired and gas out. And so he shelved the pressing. He then couldn't improve the fitness levels because of COVID, which impacted his preseason. That then meant we played without a number 10 and we went wide and developed this crossing method. Now, Arteta doesn't trust our back six's technical level, and so what he does is he gets everybody to drop deep to offer a passing option, but the trouble is that means that we don't have any players ahead of the ball to pass to, so the buildup became slow and we couldn't get out. And we saw this really evident in uh, games against City and games against Liverpool more recently. So Arteta's made many errors, namely in terms of the attacking balance, I think, in his front line, not really always consistently putting two runners and two creatives, but... Um, he has absolutely changed the off-the-ball structure to what we are seeing with these defense and goals conceded. And so that's really, uh, really key when we're trying to address what he's done. In terms of the culture, I think that's an even separate argument where he's instilled a level of accountability not seen at the club. And so when you talk about not using Ozil and people always levy, well, he had a tent and he didn't, and he didn't use him in Ozil. Well, this is part of the culture change about accepting your wounds short term to emphasize what you deem as acceptable going forward. When you have a player personally attacking the club, and I will call that attacking, it's been said in press conferences, we know these were the moles and these were the quotes that were happening in that time period when the team was going poorly. You cannot have that in the dressing room culture when you're trying to move things forward. And so when he did address those things and he knew that it would cause pain to the team, that are the fundamental pillars about a culture change when we talk about them to instill a level of accountability in the team and also to instill a level of um, kind of equal measure. When you look at Aubameyang, he hasn't treated the superstars differently. We used to with Arsene Wenger, who I love, everybody knows this, but ultimately how we treated superstars in the past was not the right way to produce the modern game and what we are. You have to level the playing field and to make sure that everybody um, is going to buy into a counter press and going to buy into the philosophy You need to make sure that no one person is better than the team. That's the biggest culture change that I've seen on the pitch and off the pitch, for that matter, in terms of how we conduct our business and how Arteta prefers to conduct his squad. Um, Current, recently in one of Arteta's press conferences, we saw Arteta mentioning how there were some people within the club that were trying to destroy whatever Arteta is trying to convey to the players. Who do you think those people were? I mean, there were talks of Mesut Ozil, but surely no, 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 it's no. kind of just it's, it's, it's very, it's very, it's very simple. We're not. This is this is ball over passion. We're not going to hide here. We we know who it is, and they we know why they left. And obviously, it's it's a it's a combination of the of Mesut Ozil and his agent. It's Socrates, Kalasinac, Mustafi. These guys are formed a clique. They found they 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 didn't like the uh, the way that the, the club was managed, and they decided to start leaking things. Uh, I don't know. That is my opinion, and that's how I view things. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Fine, call me out. I'm waiting to hear from you on Twitter. <laughs> but I I that's who I feel that that's why they left, and that's who I feel how they left. I mean, you, if you guys look on on the latest. You could see Louise today in his farewell speech. There was a, there wasn't there was a there was a togetherness in that squad. People people rallied around him. People really wanted to send him off with some pride. I don't think if it's the same squad from January, I don't think it's the same thing. And I think Arteta got rid of the right people. He got rid of people like Mustafi who doesn't have the quality to justify being in the squad, like Kalasinac, who isn't even good enough to be a backup, let's be honest. <laughs> and Ozil, who will few, like people say to me all the time on Twitter, oh, uh, he's not lazy. He's, he, he's an elite playmaker. Well, sure, he's an elite playmaker, and I don't I don't think he's lazy. I just think, just think he refuses to work in the system that Arteta wants him to work in. I, refuse, I think he refuses to want to fill out passing lanes. I think he refuses to want to get out and get, 
get his get his foot in the tackles. And if you don't want to do that, then you know where the door is. And I love Meza Ozil. I I love I, some of the passes that man has made, some of the assists that man has made. I still remember the first assist he gave to Giroud on um, the assist he made for Giroud to, uh, uh, against Sunderland in that first yeah. game. His taste touched that game. It was beautiful. And I love Meza Ozil. He's one of the greatest players I've seen play for Arsenal, but at the end of the day, it doesn't. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. So it's time to move on. Look, and, mate. You know what it is. Okay. Very simply, Ozil represented everything that we need to move on from. From a purist standpoint, there is no doubting the quality of the player. And I have often said he's probably one of the best, if not the best, playmakers of our generation. Now. When you talk about what he represents off the pitch, however, and how the leniency that we were giving superstars, that's the culture change that we cannot look to enforce in the future if we are supposed to become successful and move forward as a team. So it's not a matter of questioning the player and looking at his overall body of work, okay? Because that is not something that should be questioned. He is probably one of the best, if not the best, playmakers in our generation. His form in the last couple seasons simply did not provide enough to be selected. And when you add that to the off the pitch um, queries and um, kind of really upsetting things that he's doing, that's simply not a conducive way to conduct a football team, not just a football team, by the way, any team. When you look at it in life as a manager, as a boss, you do not deal with that. Any business. At the end of the day, Arsenal Football Club is a business. And if you don't want to, if you cannot, if you can't agree with your bosses, then you leave. And it's that simple. And I, do I think that he was unfairly treated for the China comments? That's a personal opinion. It doesn't really matter. But the point of the fact, the fact of the matter is, is sponsorships were involved and things happened. Yeah. And if you can't accept that, you can't accept that. And if he didn't accept that and he didn't want to move on, that's on him. But the fact this this whole back and forth between, okay, I'm going to save Gunasaurus to, for, for PR, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. I mean, you got out of control, and it needs, <coughs> needed to end. So I'm glad he left. Thank you for the memories. <laughs> You're one of my inspirations in going forward in terms of football knowledge and the ability to make a pass, but it's time to move on. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, think, I think we've got a good idea of, you know, what a tangent yeah yeah no no that's fine i mean we now have a good idea of the influence um artista has on the team on, on the club but i think it's good to set in stone for, for not just for us arsenal fans but just for football fans in general um it's good for us to know actually what exactly has artista brought in at arsenal what fundamentals is he you know going by what what, what is he standing by and you know what is actually his philosophy because i think it's you know we all have different opinions so some people say arteta has a has a philosophy that you know replicates um Mourinho. some people say he plays i did um, very similar to simeone and others will say you know he's a pure footballist who loves you know replicating what pep does for his team but i think yeah like i said it's good for us to you know make sure things are set in stone so i mean Chris, let's go with you, actually. Mm. What do you think? Give me three things um, that you think Otter has brought in at Arsenal, which you think is set in stone. Well, quickly on the narrative that he's a defensive coach, I think that that was created because our def- our defensive attributes have improved. I don't... And the fact that we're playing a back three. And a back three doesn't necessarily scream defensive to me. Um we 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 block we block space defensively. Um, you know, I don't think he want, he's a defensive coach. I just think he's he's very good at coaching a defense. Um, with things he wants to instill, I think central compactness is something he really loves, especially in trans in defensive transition, because we he's always talked about him. In fact, he wants physical physicality in the midfield, and with his players that party, which is a sign of wanted to control trans- transition. Um, I think he wants he wants us to be a complete team in terms of defence and attack. And our defence is proper short up right now. 
And we need to improve our, our attack. And I think that will improve with signings. And um, this this summer is proper important for him to, to really show his philosophy. And I think from the first day he came, you could see that we wanted to press, but with the fitness of the players, he couldn't do it. Um, we wanted to be compact, and you've seen that with our defensive improvement. And we wanted to be complete and score goals. And recently, we've done that. We've beaten, with today, even beaten Brian 2-0. Yeah. Um, so, that's all good. But you, have, you still need to give me three things that you've seen Arteta brought in at Arsenal and how it's impacted us. I really want to hear this. Okay. Um, one, a defensive structure. Um, you've seen that in a decrease of goals conceded. Um, two, compactness in, in a, a proper shape. You've seen that with the consistency of the use of a 3-1-6 against low box and maybe a 3-2-5 in general. And three, I think he's instilled a no-nonsense mentality in the changing. Okay. George? Um, really quite simply, um, when we talk about central compactness and blocking space, he's brought a positional awareness to the squad. When you look at our positioning and build-up in our first phase, it's really quite clear that we build in a three and we contain a general three, two, five structure. He's brought us attacking and defending in five channels. That's the second thing. And then lastly, when we talk about a counter press and affected off ball movements, we have a philosophy of triggers. We've seen this in the last four games. So those are three absolutely crucial changes that I can dictate specifically on the pitch that we have seen generally since Boxing Day, that we always build in a three. This is a non-negotiable. We always have central compactness and transition. We have bodies in the center, whether that means we have an inverted right back and we facilitate an overlapping uh, left back, or whether that transitions into having our pivot block space. We have that constant. Lastly, again, the counter press. It is very clear that there's a trigger for specific counter pressing on opponents that isolates us getting the ball in the final third. Uh, th those are three very specific things Z, that uh, you know anybody can look at and see <laughs> yeah. in terms of our overall sure. structure. Actually, I'm going to come back to you, George, because the, the, there's actually something that I really want to discuss. But um, I want to I want to speak to you, Corin. Um, what are three things off the pitch that you know Arteta has brought in, and how how do you think it's actually changed the way Arsenal are perceived um, to the general, really? Well, I think those are two very different questions. I think the second half of that question can be answered by uh, one overlying concept, which is organisation. And with with that, is it comes to the, the three things that I would say have happened on and off the pitch that have changed how the culture of the club looks. Um, First, the first thing I want to discuss in terms of organisation is the ability of the... Uh, what I haven't seen in the past and what I do see now is an ability to unleash the best players in the squad. We have had deficiencies, but the ability to unleash players like Kieran Tierney and Bukayo Saka, especially with the motion that happens with uh, Kieran Tierney overlapping and... Uh, Granit Xhaka being able to fill in that, that, that left-back spot and the interplay between the left-half space player, whoever is there, is maybe Sabayos as much as we hate him, or an Emil Smith-Rowe, or uh, Bukai Saka if he's on the left, an ability to really exploit the, the advantage we have in uh, Kieran Tierney. Another example of that first point is Bukai Saka. The ability to realise that this man is chumble man, boy, star boy, whatever you want to call him, is quite clearly a generational talent and um, someone that can really, we're still looking to see where his best role is. I mean, if we look at today's game, Pepe played so well on the left, on the right, I'm thinking to myself, hang on a second, maybe we don't need a left wing, maybe we move Saka to the left and we, we, we play, Bukai, or play Pepe on the right. I mean, that's not how I would do it, but these are the questions that, that I would say that are being answered and the ability to really exploit the best players in the, on the pitch is something that I just love very well. And lastly, um, I would like to say it's really a sense of leadership. The first time I would say since Wenger that it's been really been a, a leader as a, as a head coach, manager, whatever you want to call him, we call him manager now, but 
a real a leader in the, in the dressing room. I mean, someone that will say, look, this is my standard. You don't want to pe- play by this standard. This is how I want to play. This is the way we're doing things. You don't want to do that. There's the door. If you do want to do that, I will take you under my wing and this is how we're going to do things and we're going to do things well at this, at this club. So there's a real, I feel like in terms of culture, there is an ability to really organize the club and really say to myself, I said, really say to the fans and to the general public that this is Arsenal Football Club. This is what we represent and we are going to do things in an organized fashion and we're going to do things at a as a as a um as a slow gradual upward curve instead of going okay we're going to go up down up down up down we're going to go mm-hmm. we're going to go up and up and up but we're going to do it slowly and we're going to do it consistently fair enough no i agree with you um i think there's also one thing that I, it's probably my annoyance with arteta I, it's probably the fact that we've seen quite a few tweaks um I think a bit too many tweaks, really, with Arteta's team. I feel like he still doesn't know his best system. He still doesn't know his best team. And I, I think it could be possibly to do with the profile of players we have and availability, injuries, and and obviously the opposition. But moving forward, there has to be some stability. There has to be some... There has to be a notion where, you know, we're playing that same system for at least um, 20 games a season. Uh, what, yeah. what do you think that system could be, George? Well, we're going to build off what I've been saying previously. We're going to be building in a 3-2-5. We're going to be attacking and defending in five channels. Um, it, there's been a lot of debate about whether or not Arteta prefers a three-man midfield or a double pivot. And I think everything that we've seen points towards his preference towards a double pivot. When we look at our best attacking patterns and our attacking play down the left, the left is our most clearest example of how he views attacking patterns. And how we view that left-hand channel is we have a pivot player defending the wide spaces as a fullback full back overlaps and our winger becomes a pseudo-10 or drops into the half space and becomes an option between the lines. This is the most clearest example of attacking play that we have for Arteta. And so ideally what you would want is you want to replicate that on the right. Now, how do you facilitate that on the right? You cannot do so with a lone pivot. In fact, a lone pivot has not had the evidence to be sustainable in Europe ever. It um, it has done a great season with Man City, but it has not had sustainability in Europe. And the reason is you lack central compactness. The weakness of a system in a double pivot is not in the middle. It's actually up top. And that is okay according to Arteta's principles. His major principle is central compactness and control of transition, as well as the counter press. So you cannot have a weakness in the system centrally. And so when I when I look at what we're going to be doing in the future, that too is going to cover wide spaces as fullbacks on rush, and our wingers are going to come in as additional options between the lines. Our central cam, or so to speak, or that zone 14 player like Emil Smith-Rowe is going to be given a free role who is able to then overload both sides at will, while our striker is going to be unrestricted and can have free movement as well, as we now have options between the lines to facilitate this attacking in five channels. But again, I want to kind of emphasize this. No matter what we do, whether it's a game state change to a single pivot, double pivot, it really doesn't matter. The broad structure is a three, two, five. You will build in a three. This will always be the case. If you do want to shuttle to a to a pivot, this happens very easily. It just becomes a one-two in midfield. Yeah. I think what we do as fans, and I've talked about this quite a lot, is this FIFA mentality of having rigidity in your formation is kind of ridiculous. We don't have yeah. formations like this in football anymore. Yeah. This, yeah. this has to stop this idea that we're only going to be doing one system. We change systems three or four times in a season, and I don't want to become super tactical about it, but in game, we change three or four times, but we keep yeah. these principles in play. It's not even just about, um, yeah, as you mentioned, it's just, it's, we change multiple times in the season, but it's, you have different formations and different phases of play as well. You can't just assume that you're going to be setting up as a 4-4-2 low block in terms of defensively and still be playing a 4-4-2 going forward. That's not how football works. No. Football changes as you, as you go through the phases of play, as you go through the zones of play. And the only thing I would push back on, on with George is, do you, I would like to ask, I, I'll actually ask you this, George, do you think that this 4 2 3 one is a, is a going forward philosophy or do you think it's a personal based compromise? Well, no, we know it's a going forward philosophy because it's, it's how he has set up his buildup. 
it's it's not a matter of of projecting and band-aids because what we've seen is to our best players and our most expensive players have performed best in a pivot when we've tried to go to a single pivot even though the quality may be reduced we don't see in the same cohesiveness and attacking patterns and we've seen how he likes to orient his attacks based on the left again i go back that is the clearest example in our system and in our play of what Arteta envisions as the perfect way. We've seen it, whether it's the three at the back, whether it's four at the back, who cares? But how he structures that left-hand side is what he wants for an attacking philosophy. And that doesn't support a lone pivot. You the have thing, one option covering the fullback always. Yes. I mean, you can see, for example, with... Um, I mean, I can go. I can say, for example, with the, uh, with the FA Cup final, uh, build up. You can see that build up on the on the right to feed the left. That cross field ball that that was played into Alba so many times, going cutting in. Whereas within within the four back formation, it was a much very much a case of okay, we're going to allow the interplay between Tierney and Jacka to inter, inter interchange and then play push, push Tierney up high and play this three two five formation that is is that it, that is effective going forward. Um, as the panel knows. As some of you may know, I'm very much a 4-3-3 advocate, and I will just say just right here, I'm not going to go. We're not going to go too deep into it, but I do see the uh, the 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 the, um, the initial steps for a for a 4-3-3 going forward. Um, I see. I mean, I would I would like to see that if we're going to play 4-3-3, it's something that is going to be. Uh, very personnel uh, dependent. It depends on the personnel we bring in, and it depends on the the zones we want to play. If we want to vacate certain zones to fill other zones, to be able to uh, fill out fill out an attacking philosophy and be able to build up play from a uh, from even almost as a diamond, as a um, a, 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 a narrow diamond three four uh, a four, uh, four 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 two almost. So it depends on the formation you go, say going forward. I mean, I do see the efficiency in it for uh, 431, but I think we'll see going forward. I think it's too early to say. I think it's too early in the project to uh, dictate, okay, this is how we're going to play. And as George said, formations are fluid. There's no reason to dictate, okay, this is the way we're going to play. In-game management will dictate, opposition will dictate, and how the personnel we have available will, will dictate formation. So... I think this hang up on formation is very, very uh, narrow-minded, as I would say. Well, Z, you know what? You've asked me before, what's a non-negotiable? Sorry just to jump in. One of the non-negotiables is um, superiority out wide in how we develop build-up. Now, one of my struggles with the 4-3-3 and why I've always asked what is your opinion on it is how do you facilitate wide overloads, okay? It's not that you cannot do it in a 4-3-3, but the way you do it is far different than you do in a pivot. And this is where yes. I struggle with the long-term philosophy because in a 4-3-3 or a supposed 4-3-3, what you need is one fullback inverted consistently. Now, if our right back of choice that we go by is a profile who is inverted, I will agree with Curran and other people who are an advocate, we are going 4-3-3. But if we are looking for a similar profile, which by the way, I might add our biggest links have been a similar profile to Tierney, whether that's Hakimi, whether that's Lamptey. The profile of fullback that are the most serious links are a replica of a, of a Kieran Tierney, not an inverted person. And, and really, we have that in Callum Chambers. So he would have been incorporated I, far sooner if that was the case. I so, which, is why I, which is why I say that um, I want to see what happens this summer. If we, if, we, if we don't buy someone that can play inverted, then I'm with you, lads. 4-2-3-1, let's go. Pivot, double pivot, let's just do it. But I want to see how this summer plays out. I want to see what options he wants to bring in. And that's why I, I, I don't, I'm not too sure. I want to see how the, how the project develops. That's my that's my take. Yeah. Um, Chris, we haven't heard you speak for a while now. Um yeah. <laughs> um yeah. I want to know actually, what do you think of the formation this season? And do you think it's going to be there's going to be any changes next season? And maybe play devil's advocate for me? Um maybe okay, so I'm gonna ignore the the before but before 2021, because we had different injuries and different players who couldn't 
who wouldn't allow us to do the system that we play now. I think I, I, I actually like the system that we've had. We've got good combination play, good positional play in the system right now. Um, we do decent in transition, defensively, especially with the the three two five or against low blocks, like against Sheffield United. You saw we played a three one six with Party as the lone six. Um, yeah. I think the system we play would definitely just depend on personnel, which is why I see us renewing Chambers and maybe bang a Hakimi type to allow us to be able to switch between a four three three or four. 4-2-3-1, as people say. Um, we've, our system recently has done very well at breaking down low blocks, as I've said. Um, we've scored many goals against um, Sheffield United, Slava Prague, because of... And we Smith Rowe especially has been key to that, with him going out wide and helping with the overloads, especially on the right, with Saka and Bellerin. And we saw him doing well in the overloads just recently with, with Pepe against Crystal Palace on the right. He drifts on the right to help Saka and Bellerin or Pepe and Chambers, whoever it may be. Um, yeah, in the future it will change maybe, depending on signings. But I've been impressed with the the system we've seen implemented since Smith Rowe came back from injury. Okay, so we've spoken about Arteta's philosophy, what he's going to bring to the club. How what's his structure going to be looking like, you know, and his you know overall ro role at the club. But I think I want to make sure that this part of the podcast we're focusing on the man himself. So I think we've seen a lot of fans actually, um, non-Arsenal fans and Arsenal fans complaining about his in-game management. They've also complained about his talent ID. They're probably saying that you know. Arteta doesn't rate the players that, you know, us fans in general love, like Balogun, Martinelli, Saliba, Grinduzi. Um, What do you think, um, let's say, Curran, what do you think of um, Arteta? What do you think of his in-game management? What do you think of his man management? There's two very, very different questions there. I mean, his man management, I feel like he's, as I said before, his, his philosophy of ruthlessness and his, his ability to really say, this is the standard I want at Arsenal Football Club. We are a world-class club. We are a historic club. And if you cannot deal with that, leave. And I'm very happy with how that happens. And people keep going on about these loans. I mean, you look at how Joe Willock is doing. And if you really think you're not excited about Joe Willock next season, then I feel sorry for you. I don't know what's going on. And the same thing with William Saliba, one of the best best defenders in Liga. I mean, the FIFA merchants will be saying, well, you didn't get a team of the season. Why don't you get a team of the season? I, I think he's had a very, very good season. And he's someone that I really think going forward is going to be someone crucial for us. So in terms of uh, his man management, I'm very happy. Lay down the law, do what you make sure that you are getting across what you want to get across. And this is your team. At the end of the day, you are the person, as he said, hit me in the chest. I This is my team. I, I am responsible for these players. So... In terms of that, very happy. In terms of in-game management, I've seen some issues. I mean, the Villarreal game, um, sometimes he goes galaxy brain. Um, some His in-game, his, his, his inability to make substitutions earlier is evident. Sometimes with that Villarreal game, it was clear that there were substitutions that needed to be made to really change that game in the second leg, and he didn't make them. And it disappointed me. I'm not going to be... Some, I'm not going to be um, bias towards one side, I can see the argument there for his his deficiencies in that game and a number of games a season when you just think, hang on a second, the changes are there, um, the the ability to go, uh, the ability to, to change the game is there, you haven't done it. And the last thing I would like to say is um, this, this narrative in our fan base that he does not like Gabriel Marcelli is... I think one of the, as someone who works in healthcare, is one of the dumbest things I've heard on the internet. Uh, Gabriel Martinelli had one of the most serious injuries that we have in sports medicine. I mean, George can back me up on this. And the amount of caution that he's shown, if he didn't care about Gabriel Martinelli, you're playing in January. You're playing in January and he would have got re-injured. The amount of care and the amount of caution that that, 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 that Arteta has shown to Gabriel Martinelli is something that should be commended and should be 
um, something that we, when we look back on his term, we should really credit him for because we, everyone on this panel knows that Gabriel Martinelli is going to be a global superstar, someone that will be world class, someone that's elite in, in, in terms of the league and in the world. He's someone that is going to change the, the notion of, of, of football, I feel anyway. That could be one of my Callum Chambers, Tony Adams takes, but it's something that I really believe. I believe in Gabriel Martinelli and I believe that he's someone that is going to change this club. So when you when you think of it in that in those terms, if you if you're Mikel Arteta, do you risk him just for maybe a Conference League place? No, you bring him in slowly, you give him some sub appearances, and you let him develop. So I think man management wise, fine in terms of in game management. There are signs that he needs some improvement, but I'll take it so far. Mm -hmm. Um, I think maybe you probably. Thought my question wrong. The reason why I actually bought in game in game management is because there's actually a lot of fans thinking that Arteta picks his favorites um, when it comes to substitutions. Oh, yeah. oh, I thought you meant actually substitutions and then in game yeah. changes. Yeah. Um, in terms, of, I'll just give yeah. you answer that. In terms of picking his favorites, I think if you're looking at favorites and you're looking at people that you really think that um, that he likes, okay. I mean, it's it's his team. He puts out who he wants to put out. If, if he puts out an eleven on the team every game, that he thinks will win that game. If if you don't like that, that's on you. That's not on him. He wants to win every game of football, and he will put out the eleven that he puts out. That's that's on the Mikel Arteta, and that's any manager in this in this league. So that is my answer to that. If you don't like the, the changes, you're more than welcome to complain about them. But he is someone that will really put across his opinion. And put out a team that will win a game, in his opinion. Um, what, what's your opinion, George? What do you think about his in-game management? Um, you can talk about his man management on a completely separate um, topic. It's up to you. <laughs> yeah, no, um, I use those two to provide our Teta outers their argument because I find them arguing things that are not true. Actually, his in-game management is something I would agree with. He looks a phenomenal coach and a beginning manager. And, and what I mean by that is he is slow to react. He, he, he is, um, he, he carries very much the Wenger of not, no substitutions to the 70th minute. I don't know if people remember that, but everyone thinks he comes that from Pep. I actually think he gets yeah. that from Wenger. Um, he, he, he's very slow to, and, and hesitant to change the team um, that, where he should. I, I do agree. He needs to improve on that. In terms of his squad management, I, I hope he will use this season to uh, become more firm in his beliefs because I do feel that the Villa Real was not even just a galaxy brain moment, but it was an idea that you had the profiles to replicate that attacking pattern of play and you chose not to do it. And we saw it after Villa Real. So uh, I do think in, in terms of the game management sense, he is struggling um, at times, but again, like this is his first couple of years of management. I didn't expect there to be a clear upward exponential trajectory. I expected <clears> that. <throat> um, but one thing I will say is every single situation, we have evidence of Arteta being humble enough to change and to actually accept that he was wrong. I case in point, Nicholas Pepe, and I you bring this example up in terms of him learning from his mistake and translating that to how he dealt with Shaka. So I'll just really quickly do this. If people remember, how when Nicolas Pepe received his red card earlier in the season, he was chastised in the media. He was very cl clearly critiqued by Arteta. I thought that was a bad call as a coach and as a manager. You never do that. You never publicly lamb blast your players. No matter how much you feel that they may have been in the wrong, I was very upset that he did that. You then fast forward to Granit Xhaka. Um, he did not do the same thing when he received his red card. And again, I find that as a level of growth. Now, did that mean that earlier in the season he was wrong? Yes, let's be clear. He made a mistake. He shouldn't have done it. But he learned from that mistake. So overall, um, I think those are the two areas of, or, that Arteta needs probably the best. I think um, substitutions are probably my biggest critique right now. I think he understands squad management to a degree that when he has the tools, this doesn't become an issue of overthinking things. I think he's shown that. Um, but substitutions, I agree. I think it's something that he will become much better with experience. It's actually the last thing as a coach you learn. I'll be honest with you, as a coach, when you do go through licensing, if anyone has done it, I've done a couple licensing myself, um, formations, and you know when you talk about technicalities and tactics, those are the uh, first things you consider. 
But um, gain state is the last thing that you can learn only through experience. Um, Chris, you have anything to add to um, to keep it short? I think he's a in terms of his substitutions. I think he's very reactive and could be definitely be more proactive. I think that's something that will develop as he gets more experience. Um, and I think in terms of his squad management, I think we've done we've done well to remove certain players who should have been removed a long time before Arteta came. But and I think he needs to do more of that this summer. Yeah. And on the quickly on the Martinelli point, I think that we will reap the benefits of Martinelli gain a lot more rest, especially with the I think it was a knee injury. And for such explosive players, playing on a knee injury will be very negative. And you'll see I, I, I don't think other young players, maybe Pedro Neto, will get the same benefits that you'll see from Marinelli just from being able to to have more rest to the knee injury. Very good point. Look, Chris, um, I understand you have a short point, but I, I, I just want to know one thing. Do you think Artis actually has any favourites at the club? Do, do you think he has a group of players that he wants to play all the time? And do you think it could have some sort of negative effect on the other players? I mean, what do you think? I think he just has trust in certain players more, like mm. Saka. And I think, for example, Saka, I think everyone knows that he should have been playing maybe less games towards the end of the season. But I think from Arteta, there may have been a subconscious or conscious fear of if I don't play my best player in Saka, Arsenal might lose. Um, I think it's just f fear, to be honest. And I think with more security and improvement in performances, you'll see other players play more, I think. Okay, um, I think uh, now that you know the season's finished as well, we're, we're approaching the transfer window. Um, we already, I think we have an idea of what Arsenal want, what Arteta want, wants. But what do you think of the profiles he's targeting? Um, what do you think? Um, what do you think of Arteta's talent ID currently? So, in terms of profiles, that was the question about profiles. Of the club. Um, no, it's, the question is, what do you think of? Arteta's targets and his talent ID? Um, okay, so if we're looking at this transfer window and the and what we, what we know of this transfer window, I mean, I'm sure there are things that we don't know, but from what we do know, um, the targets are a, things like a, a right back, a left back, and uh, another eight, and maybe a left winger. So if you look at the these are the areas that we've struggled at this season. And if we look at the talent ID, I mean, what I define talent ID is, is the amount, the, is the way that you actually uh, fill out the profile that you want to fill out. So if you're looking at the profile of of the player that we're linked to, for example, uh, Ahusam Awa, who I feel walks into this club and has a massive effect on the team. Or an Emiliano Buendia, who also would walk in, I would say maybe not to the same effect, because I feel like he's more of a generalised player in, in, the, in the roles that we have, and is not exactly the profile we need. Samawa is someone that I personally think that is, I mean, he's had, a, he's had by his standards, a poor season at Lille. But, uh, sorry, Leon, sorry, sorry, Leon. And... Um, but if you look at his profile and if you look at the identification of talent available in Hosamawa, I think it's someone that I really feel that is, is, is someone that would really improve our squad and someone that would really take our squad going forward. Um, the other positions, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I, with transfer rumours, it's sort of like I, I don't want to just sort of ha uh, go on, okay, uh, Hakimi or... Uh, Kamavinga or these these sort of things. I would rather go with things players that I feel like are realistic. And Hakimi, I know today's come out and said he doesn't want to leave, but um, and there but there is a there is a way that has that uh, that he can obviously come. Rumors are rumors after all. Um, but I like the way he's developing the squad and the talent identification is something that I feel going forward is has to be something that will be evaluated this summer. This summer is very, very key in terms of, okay, this is the type of squad he wants, this is the type of player he wants, and this is the type of talent he wants. So I, I don't want to judge him yet. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Chris, what do you think about Arteta's talent ID? Do you actually trust him with this window? I think arguably you'd say that it's probably our most important window in a long time. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I think that he, I think he's definitely, he himself has realised maybe even over the course of the season, how important certain profiles have been to his team with him bringing, for example, him bringing in Smith Rowe and him even saying today that after him coming in, we've been one of the best teams since December. And that's the levels we can hit with the right profiles in the team. He said that himself. And I think that just shows that he's he can he's noticed the the change certain profiles will have on our team. Um I think his talent ID is actually good with the players he signed so far with Parte, um, Gabriel, Mari. Cedric all look to be good signings and will be beneficial to us in the future. Um, this summer is, is is so crucial to get us in the future, in my opinion. This summer will probably stabilise us and prepare us, if gone right, to be one of the best teams in the league for Ooh, the next okay. decade. For the next okay. decade. Ooh. It's five years, I would say. I, don't say sure. I, say, I say decade. George, I'm going to let you have this one. What's your opinion? On his ID, it's 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 excellent. I mean, you just have to factually look at like who he's brought in and what are the common threads between the two. It's, it, they, they consistently have um, a defense space really quite well. They're two ways, and they all win their individual battles. I've actually said for a long time, if you follow me on Twitter, uh, you look at all the profiles that I've mentioned, and they carry three major fundamentals. They are um, ball-carrying progressive talents, they are two-way, and they're elite over the first five-yard burst. This is common in Thomas Partey and Gabrielle. Cedric and Mari are backup signings, but they all are able to defend space, and they follow the same philosophy. He's building this team from the back to the front, and that is actually how, uh, as a pragmatist and a fellow pragmatist in a coaching matter, that's how I prefer to set up my teams as well. It, when you look simply at his starting additions, by the way, and I want to make that clear, you have to look at Gabrielle and Partey. Those are his additions. Those are his starting 11 changes. And between those, that's a very modern set of philosophies in terms of competing in, in all thirds and in transition. So we, we absolutely know that his talent ID for what he wants. And also with Usama Awar, who had a very strong link in the summer, I think that's not uh, deniable really at this point. Um, that's the type of eight he wants. And so when you yeah. combine those three, in every single third of the pitch. And I use that very loosely. If we can go back, it's Gabrielle, Partey, and Awar. That's a player in every single third of the pitch who has exactly what I've said. Elite over five yards, has transitional control, and are ball-carrying progressors. These are the C the major gaps in this team. So every single addition has to be those type of profiles. So in the future, we look at right back, we look at center mid, even the Eves Basuma link. Lads, what does he have in common? Ball-carrying progressor, he is yeah. elite over the first five yards. Uh, he doesn't have the transition control that I would love, but he certainly has it in profile. And so he is a central anchor, and he follows that philosophy. So actually picking these targets, lads, it becomes very simple if you really analyze the weakness of the team. It doesn't take a genius to figure out which teams and which names that we're going to be linked to. Just to add just something on quickly is, in terms of the 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 the, uh, the point that George just made about pragmatism, um, if you're building a team, you would prefer to build a team because if we look at if we look at how we start, how 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 uh, teams should I mean personally how I think teams should be built, you want to build from a base. You want to build a team which where you can you can go to a you can go to world because everyone even the casuals know the world class elite talents that win you games are in the final third. So you want to be able to say to any elite player in in world football, look, we have a system here. We'll 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 we'll, we'll do the job at the back. You go and do what you want to do. We'll we'll feed you the ball. We'll get you the ball. Go go back at us 25, 30 goals a season. You go and do what you are best at, and we got you. So in terms of building the squad, I want to build a squad, and I think this is what Mikel's doing is I want to build a defensively solid solid squad that is able to really progress the ball well and feed players at an elite, players at an elite level, to feed elite level players so that you can have players scoring goals and having them at a world-class elite level. So 
I feel like this is the whole point of the rebuild so far, and that's why I trust Mikel, how he's building and how his talent ID has gone so far. Yep. Um, so I think we're approaching towards the end of the podcast, but before I wrap everything up, um, at the start of the podcast, I asked all of you guys, are you Arteta in? And George, Curran, and Chris all told me you're all Arteta in. But is there any is is there any other any manager in the world that you might actually choose over him for Arsenal Football Club? That's available. Not not saying available. I'm saying, is there any manager in the world that you'd pick over Arteta right now? In the current circumstances, no. Even in <laughs> even in ideal circumstances, maybe, <laughs> maybe. But right now, definitely not. Z, I'll, I'll answer this very simply for you. It's a matter of squad quality. It is not a manager. I, I hate this idea that there's a one pill fixes all approach. And quite simply, this squad is not up to the level. And so regardless, if I were to recruit Pep Guardiola to, tomorrow, he will struggle with this team. And by the way, he did when he first came in. He waited until he recruited the right profiles. And the following season, you were able to see a team that was complete to his liking to carry his philosophy. So if you, like, if you want to ask me, what are, what are coaches that I like? Sure, your Nogglesmans, your Jesse Marshes, your Marcelo Gallardos. These are all managers that attack and defend in five channels. But lads, we have one who has that philosophy. He doesn't have the team. So regardless of whether or not you, you're Arteta in or out, you have to be real and objective on the evaluation of the squad. Current. Other thing I'll say is that uh, this the one narrative that I want to crush on this on this on this uh, podcast is, especially this one because it's the Arteta podcast, is that this notion is, oh, it's easier to sack one guy than it is to sack ten. Well, sure, of course, in, pra in, in in practice, maybe. But the fact of the matter is, is that that one manager controls the philosophy of your club, controls the philosophy of how you play on the pitch, and controls in in reality your results. Apart from how you, unless you want to talk, bring into account freak accidents or bozo mistakes or whatever, they control how you play. So bringing in someone or firing someone is not as easy as people make it out to be. You have to really be sure. And at this moment in time. I am very, 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 very far from sure that I want to come out. I, I've, I've supported the club since I was, what, seven years old. I haven't been as confident defensively about this, about an Arsenal team in almost, I would say, I mean, certainly since the Czech um, uh, um, Koscielny days, but mm -hmm. even going back further to the Invincible days or... Um, or around then, the SoCal Makolatora days, the last, the last real defense we had was Koscielny, Matsako, Czech, and it wasn't as secure, I would say, as this one is. Hot take alert, maybe, but I prefer this defense, and I feel like it's something that can really be developed further in this in, in the team. So, in terms of Mikel in, Mikel out, or in terms of world football managers, as George mentions, Julian Negosman is very good, Hansi Flake is very good, Jesse Marsh is very good. Galado is very good. But I prefer Mickey Lott. So that's my take. Well, is there anything else you guys want to add before I wrap it up? I'm good. The only thing that I would add, mate, is I, I think you cannot, whether you're Arteta in, whether you're Arteta out, we need to back the club. And you cannot be adjudicating your position on morality of the person. That's the only thing I want to say. So while it's very divisive, you know, as long as you carry logic for both your opinion, I think everything's valid to critique. And you cannot look at Mikel Arteta and solely as a positive light. He has his faults. He's made his mistakes. And I kind of want to make it clear because we are very Arteta in and we've been very positive on what we're projecting in the future. But I, I want to make it clear. We have seen faults. We have seen him make mistakes and they have not been good. It just simply looks when I tally up the pros and the cons, I see far more pros than I do cons. And I look at trend lines. I don't look at specific isolated incidences when I look at my opinion. And the trend line is overwhelmingly positive. And I think we've done a good enough job of looking at it both in numbers, but also the fun stuff, the subjective stuff, why we love yeah. him and, and off the pitch. So that's the only thing I would say on this where Mikel will see his vision and the project will go bang, as he says, next season. Count on it. And let me quickly say, um, with our I see big things next season probably more optimistic than most people 
<laughs> I think we'll definitely get top four next season. And quickly, um, this season we conceded 39 goals and the last time we conceded less than that was 15-16. And we finished yep. second with 36 goals only conceded. That's all I wanted to say to me. Just the last thing, just to add on. I've seen a lot of this on social media. Um, people, I don't know where this has come from. I, maybe this is the AFTV culture, which we'll touch on another podcast, but or the internet culture in general. But I've seen a lot of a lot of people have wanted Mikel out to be right about Mikel, and I don't really understand it. If you're one of those people, please comment below and explain why that's the case. But I, if I'm, I'm going to be real with you, I'm not going to hold back here. I don't respect it at all. And I don't think you're someone that is going to be uh, a guardian of the club. I think you're just in it for yourself and you want to be right and gain followers. So if that's the case, that's the case. So um, I don't, that's, that, that's my take. I just, I just think that you have to be looking out for the badge first and, the, and yourself second. So I think we'll round off on that. Yeah. Well, I think this is where we uh, round up the podcast. Um, thank you to Chris, Curran and George for joining. Um, thank you, Z, for hosting. Thank you, Z, mate. <laughs> um, yeah. Hold well mate. Um, follow us at um, on Twitter at Ball Over Passion. Um, we'll be posting this rendition of the podcast on YouTube. Um, be sure to follow us on Spotify. Google um, Google Podcast and on Apple Podcast as well. Um, so that's all from me. Take care. And last thing, Arteta in. Arteta in, boys.